All right, well, let's bring in our journalist panel to talk about the week that was on Parliament Hill. Robert Fife is Ottawa Bureau Chief for The Globe and Mail. Laura Osman is a reporter with the Canadian Press, and Joël Denis Bellevance is Ottawa Bureau Chief for La Presse. Good to see all of you. Thanks for having us. So we have these two opposition motions that were really driving uh, the debate this week on Parliament Hill, and I want to start with that motion on carbon pricing. Uh, Laura, at the end of the day, that Conservative motion did not pass. As expected, we didn't really think that we were going to be heading into an election this spring, and we still have the Prime Minister and the Environment Minister really uh, telling Canadians, look, this is going to happen. This carbon price increase is happening on April 1st. We are not changing course. So what do you think the Conservatives got out of this debate this week? So the Conservatives never thought that they were going to be able to bring down the government this week. That wasn't their intention. In fact, they were counting on the fact that other parties were going to impose them. That's because they want to send the message to Canadians that they're willing to go to battle over this issue, that this is the number one thing that they care about because they believe it's the number one thing Canadians care about. It's become a symbol for the affordability crisis in Canada. Uh, they wanted to send a message that they are going to do everything in their power as an opposition party uh, to try to address this, you know, this hike. They want to spike the hike. They want to ax the tax, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to do it. And if people really want it done, clearly the other opposition parties are not going to be on board. The Conservatives are the only option. Uh, and so as government, that's the only way that it's going to happen. And it was a message that Pierre Polyev was really hammering home all week, especially on Wednesday in question period, uh, going up against the Prime Minister, J.D. And, you know, the answer back from the Prime Minister and other Liberals uh, has been twofold. Number one, uh, the Conservatives don't have a plan for climate change. And number two, they want to take away the carbon rebate, which they have, of course, uh, rebranded. Uh, so what do you think of the Liberal messaging this week, and, and is it going to be resonating in the weeks to come? I don't think so, because the Liberals' message is more complicated to understand than the Tories' message. The message from the Tories is very simple. Axe the tax, everybody understands that. Whereas when you uh, go into the Liberals' messaging, it's more complicated because you say, you pay a tax, but you get a rebate, and it favors 8 out of 10 um, families in Canada. So on that front, the Liberals are more on the defensive. But I'd like to go back to what the Tories were trying to achieve. I think they want to make sure that everybody perceives the other parties in the same matter, favorable to attacks. And I think it's sort of a rehearsal for the Conservative. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if they come back again with a motion to uh, defeat the government in the coming months because they're driving for an election. They want an election right now because the polls are very favorable. And also, um, I think it's good theater. Also, in the House of Commons, it's good to raise money for the Conservative Party, whereas the coffer is already full of money and they have want more to spend more on uh, maybe probably advertising and getting ready for the federal election when it comes. Yeah, and Bob, what do you think about the maneuvering uh, between the parties this week on this? It is interesting that there is this element now of provincial politics coming into the debate, not just from premiers, but uh, conservatives making hay of the fact that, look, it's not just provincial conservatives pushing back, it's liberals and new Democrats in provincial parties in opposition across the country. So what do you make of the communication challenges and, and the policy here? Well, uh, you know, the liberals shot themselves in the foot when they exempted home heating fuel on Atlantic provinces uh, for purely political reasons to help their base in Atlantic Canada. Now, yes, they've now extended home heating and fuel across the country, but the fact of the matter is uh, most people, it's natural gas, and they're still having to pay a tax on that. So uh, they've hurt themselves. Their credibility has been shot by this. Uh, Mr. Polyev, because we're in inflationary times and the cost of living has gone up considerably, he's been able to really use this very, very effectively. So people are saying, hey, I don't want to have... I don't want to have this big uh, 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 increase that's going to af affect my groceries or my heating bills or whatever, even though uh, he doesn't say this, but 80 percent of that money is rebated back. But the Liberals have been very ineffective in dealing with this. And uh, I don't know whether they can, uh, I don't know how they're going to be able to succeed in beating Mr. Polyev on, on this front, except that they are quite legitimately uh, right in saying, where's your plan, Mr. Polyev? Because he doesn't have one. Yeah. Okay, let's go to another opposition motion uh, that's been continuing to re reverberate throughout the week, and that is Monday's motion from the NDP on the Middle East. Uh, this was an emotional debate, Bob, uh, that 
turned confusing for a lot of MPs on, <laughs> on Monday evening. We had an NDP motion amended at the last minute uh, with liberal uh, amendments, and it did pass, but we did have three liberals notably voting against, including Anthony House father, who's uh, now saying that he feels isolated in the party, uh, that he feels that some liberals crossed the line by supporting uh, the NDP's position. He's reflecting on his role in the party. What do you think this all means? Do you think there's an actual chance that Mr. House father could leave the Liberal caucus? Uh, look, he's been very uncomfortable uh, for uh, since October 7th and the reaction uh, amongst many people to what has been happening in, Ga in Gaza. Um, and let's face it, there has been a rise in anti-Semitism. We know that uh, mm -hmm. as a result of this. Um, not to say that we don't shouldn't care about what's happening to the poor people in Gaza. I mean, this is a terrible situation that they're going through. But I don't think he's going to quit. Uh, he was unhappy uh, a couple of months ago on the very same subject, and then they gave him, made him a parliamentary secretary, and he seemed to quiet down. Um, let's see if he goes anywhere. I, I, he wouldn't find a home, really, in the Conservative Party. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a, I just can't see him sitting in that party. So I, I don't think he's going to go, but if he does go, uh, it's uh, it's it's not good for the Liberals, and um, you know it's again this uh, government in their ninth year tired, and when you start to split and people start splitting, uh, as we saw on uh, on Monday, uh, with uh, a good number of Liberal MPs uh, willing to support the original NDP motion. Um, it's difficult. It's, it's not a good moment for the Liberals, and it's not going to. It doesn't seem to be getting any better. And I don't even know why they got themselves involved in all of this to begin with. They should have said, "We're going to vote against the NDP motion." Yeah, Laura, what stands <clears> out <throat> for you and how these talks unfolded between the Liberals and the NDP on what is today actually the second anniversary of the Liberal NDP confidence and supply agreement? You know, I think that it's possible that one of the motivations for the Liberals working so hard to try to find a way to support that motion by bringing forward these amendments in the 11th hour, 7 p.m. after a very long and emotional debate, uh, was that it was going to appear as though the split in the party was even greater if they had voted against it, because so many Liberal MPs had come forward to say they wanted to uh, support the original uh, NDP motion, that they felt morally compelled to do so. And I think, you know, this debate, the tension between, you know, the Palestinian plight and the Palestinian uh, right to, you know, self-determination and Israel's right to defend itself has been playing out all over the country for months now. It's created fissures in institutions across the country. It's created fissures in friends groups and families across the country. It's no surprise that it's also happening in the Liberal Party where there's a diversity of views. It's one of the most divisive issues in the world right now. Um, but I think that the Liberals have been trying to walk this line where they keep everyone happy. And as a result, they have made t the two opposing uh, views in their party unhappy. And, and people have been frustrated by that. And I think that's why people wanted to support the NDP motion in the first place. And I think that's why Anthony Housefather felt rather betrayed when the government at the last minute uh, changed their position. JD, where do you think this goes from here now? Because obviously, you know, Israel, Hamas, Gaza, the story yeah. isn't going away. That conflict isn't going away, uh, especially when MPs come back two weeks from now. This is still likely to be front and center. Yeah, exactly. That's a good question. And there is some confusion about what some of the clauses in the motion actually mean. Namely, what does it mean when uh, Canada says we're not going to export military arms to Israel? Is it an embargo? Some say yes, it is an embargo. Some say no, it's not an embargo. So even after this was voted on in the Liberal caucus, there seemed to be division about what it actually means. And I think this issue will remain divisive in the Liberal Party for the foreseeable future for the following reason. I talked to some Liberal MPs yesterday about this, and they said that Melanie Jolie, the cabinet minister, was negotiating for the government with the NDP, spent more time talking to the NDP than to the Liberal caucus. So they're angry with that minister about her uh, failing to consult properly the Liberal caucus on why the government introduced those amendments to the NDP motion. So it will leave traces of division for the foreseeable future. And I think the Liberals, I think, uh, is also, I think, um, having some trouble uh, with the, the kind of relationship it had built with the Jewish community in Canada. Now it has some I think uh, accountability to uh, give to the community as we move on. Okay, we have a few minutes left, and I want to talk about another story that's continuing to per percolate on Parliament Hill. That is 
federal contracting and procurement. Uh, JD, your newspaper has been doing a lot of reporting on this. And uh, we had the government come out and announce uh, this week that they've done this internal audit. They've found $5 million in false bidding uh, with three subcontractors. And they're saying, look, there's more to come. We're doing more of these investigations. So how bad do you think it's going to get? I think they probably broke the story before either the Globe or La Presse <laughs> broke that story <laughs> because the blog and uh, the blog, the Globe and Mail has been breaking a lot of story on this as well. So I think they wanted to go ahead of the curve. So to be, if there was any damage, they would be seen as doing something about it. But it's quite revealing that this is a problematic issue for the government in terms of uh, procurement. We've seen it in the military. Buying uh, military equipment is problematic. Now, buying simple things has become problematic for the government. So, And people understand the little value, you know, if they can understand what it means, one million, two million. So uh, this is very problematic for the government, and they wanted to go ahead. And I was told that they're using artificial intelligence now to collect data and to make sure that if there is, you know, by crisscrossing data, they can take out the bad apples that way. So uh, that's a new phenomenon that is being used by the government to try to root out any corruption, a new uh, development also on that front. Yeah, and Bob, uh, as well on this story this week, some pretty interesting and conflicting testimony uh, that we had at Committee on National Defense from uh, senior officials and one of those contractors under scrutiny, seemingly at odds about whether there's a conflict uh, of interest to play I mean, in that story. So, tell us, tell us. So, so guy, what does this guy, mean? Uh, is, he's got a, a multi-million dollar uh, company that he's getting millions and millions of dollars from the Canadian government, and then he goes to work as a regular eighty thousand dollar a year employee at uh, National Defense Department. Doesn't tell anybody. Apparently, doesn't tell anybody uh, that he's doing this. Clearly, uh, Bill Matthews, who is the uh, deputy minister uh, uh, um, at, at National Defense, is, is saying that there is a lot more to this story than uh, than we currently know. Well, he's the RCMP have been called in, uh, but I think actually this is this is one. He's one. There's one bad apple, but I think we're just scratching the surface. I think there is a lot more of this going on. And the only good thing that's going to come from this, hopefully, is that we'll have proper measures in place to make sure this doesn't happen again. But uh, I don't think this is going to be the end of it. Okay, Laura, very quick last word to you on that. On these measures uh, that Bob's talking about, we had uh, ministers come out and say that they've got this suite of new measures to try and put a stop to some of these practices. Do you think that's going to be good enough to weather the political storm that the government is still under? I mean, politically speaking, no. Uh, practically speaking, to stop bad contracting actors, probably not. You know, I think that this is a massive problem that most likely has been going on for decades, to be fair to the Liberals. But, um, you know, their information systems are so out of date that one contractor can build two departments for the same work and be paid twice. You know, that's a problem. So they really need to make investments to, to stop this. Politically speaking, though, even though this had nothing to do with ArriveCan, it has everything to do with ArriveCan. And, you know, the same issues cropping up over and over again uh, start to smack of incompetence, and, and that starts to tell a story that, that's going to stick with the Liberals. All right, we have to leave it there. Thanks to all three of you for this.